Pushkin. There's a place in our world where the dubious things end up. A morgue of fakes, hoaxes, frauds, and conspiracy theories. I've got a wall of televisions in here. I think it's a hoax. I think it's a hoax by the newspapers and the Democrats. So based on based on what you've been reading. A lot of this stuff, no matter what it's supposedly about, the pandemic, the election, it sounds like a broken record. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. Everybody knows that. It's a it's a complete hoax. Or it's like a Russian doll. Crack open one hoax and inside there's just another hoax. Hoax after hoax. This is nothing but a hoax. It's a hoax because as soon as the impeachment was over, they needed something else to bring down Trump. And they had to bring the economy down. And this is it. And I'll tell you why. So wait, you, wait, you, wait you, James, you think that somebody conspired to have a, a virus to, to bring, bring down the president? Oh, yeah. Okay. The deep state. The deep state. Conspiracy theorists look for patterns. They connect the dots. But that's also how historians work, even here, in a place that lies half-hidden in the shadow of doubt, where the sign on the door reads, The Last Archive. That's where I'm digging through my files to find the hoax story that started it all. T-minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. 1969, the dawn of the age of Aquarius. The dawn of the age of the hoax. Step through an airlock to Cape Canaveral, Florida. The Kennedy Space Center. Launch time. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are confirmed to go. When NASA launched Apollo 11 in July 1969, that rocket fractured time and space. People who watched on television live remember it. I was too little, but for most people, this was a television event. Not a big bang of an idea like Copernicanism or Darwinism. It was something you watched on a screen, as if it were a TV show, like Gunsmoke or Bonanza, a television episode. But it also was a dream, and it was a big idea. Since the dawn of humanity, people had lain awake in the chill and dark of night and looked up at the stars and the moon and wondered, what's up there? Or who? Then, at the start of the Kennedy administration, the president said it was time to find the answers. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. The audacity of it staggers me. In the middle of the 20th century, in the middle of an arms race, at the height of the techno-swagger of the Cold War, the United States decided to conquer the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. We will win the moon. We will win the race to the moon. It began with a big idea in 1961, but when it finally came off, when it happened, and was broadcast live in 1969, it became a big idea disguised as a TV event, a miniseries. Beginning with the rocket's launch on July 16th at 9.32 a.m. Eastern. Five. Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The United States had been launching people into orbit and beyond for nearly a decade at this point. But this launch was hard to believe it was really happening, partly because of where it was going. Norman Mailer, the bad boy of mid-century American letters, wrote a series of essays about it for Life magazine. The event was so removed, so unreal, that no objective correlative existed to prove it had not been an event staged in a television studio, like the greatest con of the century. Here's what made Mailer sure the moon mission wasn't a con. Going to the moon was hard. 
But faking it and the conspiracy required to cover up the fake would have been even harder. It would have been impossible. If it were bogus, Mailer said, it would have been as incredible an accomplishment in mass hoodwinking as the actual mission was in technology. It would take criminals and confidence men mightier, more trustworthy, and more resourceful than anything in this century or the ones before. So that makes sense to me. It'd be way too complicated to fake this. Why not just go to the moon? All the same, a not small number of Americans began to think the moon mission was a hoax, that there had really been a mass hoodwinking. But believe it or not, some people say it never happened. This whole thing was a fake. Decide for yourself as we explore the evidence. The angle has landed. Could the government have orchestrated the deception of the century? NASA could have pulled off the greatest hoax of all time. Welcome to The Last Archive, the show about how we know what we know, how we used to know things, and why it seems lately as if we don't know anything at all. I'm Jill Lepore, and this is our season of doubt. What about going to the moon led to the rise of the modern age of the hoax, and to the idea that history itself couldn't be trusted? It had taken seven years from the day Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon, to the launch itself. The effort cost nearly $200 billion in 2021 money. No bucks, no buck Rogers, NASA guys told Congress. But Congress kept ponying up all that money, not so much because members of Congress were looking to the future, but because they were looking to the past. Specifically, to something that had happened in 1957. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. In 1957, the Soviet Union had launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik. At the time, Kennedy was a Massachusetts senator. He publicly blamed President Eisenhower for what had been dubbed a missile gap, for falling behind the Soviets in the space race. Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson warned that soon the Russians will be dropping bombs on us from space like kids dropping rocks onto cars from freeway overpasses. Historians have come to see since that there really was no missile gap, which is what Eisenhower had always insisted. Still, with some reluctance, Eisenhower agreed to establish NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's easy to think American voters were super gung-ho about NASA and about going to the moon. But Americans were not gung-ho about the moon mission. At hardly any point between the day Kennedy announced the mission and the day American astronauts landed on the moon did a majority of Americans support the moonshot. Instead, critics called it a moondoggle. For one thing, a lot of people thought, not unreasonably, that there were other better things to spend taxpayer money on. The head of the National Urban League said, it will cost $35 billion to put two men on the moon. It would take $10 billion to lift every poor person in this country above the official poverty standard this year. Something is wrong somewhere. The day before the launch, civil rights activists staged a protest at the Kennedy Space Center. Ralph Abernathy gave a speech that even now unsettles me. We may go on from this day to the heavens beyond. But as long as racism, poverty, hunger, and war prevail on the earth, we as a civilized nation have failed. Among the skeptics of the moonshot were some of the astronauts' own wives. The wife of a member of the crew of Apollo 10 said, If you think going to the moon is hard, try staying at home. There's a strange sexual politics to the Cold War race to conquer space. Few people said this more squarely than the writer and scientist Rachel Carson, who, when the Soviets launched their first satellite, had been writing a book she'd been calling Man Against the Earth. In pre-Sputnik days, it was easy to dismiss so much as science fiction fantasies. Now, the most far-fetched schemes seem entirely possible of achievement and man seems actually likely to take into his hands, ill-prepared as he is psychologically, 
many of the functions of God. So yes, even before the moonshot, there were people who were skeptical about it, about men trying to become gods by flying to the skies. There were misgivings. But how did we get from doubts and misgivings to a full-on conspiracy theory? One answer to that question lies in the history of hoaxes. I started to have a hunch that hoaxes weren't about what, uh, certainly what the hoaxers said they were, but even what people sometimes wrote about that they were. Kevin Young is the poetry editor of The New Yorker and director of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. He's also the author of a very on-the-nose book. Oh, and my book is Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Humbug, Plagiarist Phonies, Post Facts, and Fake News. I called Young because it was in his book that I'd first read of the moon hoax. Not the theory that American astronauts never went to the moon in 1969, but a completely different hoax perpetrated in the 19th century by an American penny newspaper, the New York Sun. In 1835, the Sun ran a series about some astounding new astronomical discoveries. Recent discoveries in astronomy will build an imperishable monument to the age in which we live and confer upon the present generation of the human race a proud distinction through all future time. In the 1830s, astronomers had been debating whether life could exist on the moon. The scientific consensus tended toward no, because astronomers had been able to determine that there is no atmosphere on the moon. No atmosphere, no life. Still, they weren't certain. There was room for doubt. So, playing on this doubt, the sun perpetrated a hoax. Sir John Herschel, a famous Scottish astronomer, had just built an enormous telescope in South Africa. That was true. But then the Sun published what it claimed was a reprint of a journal article, reporting to an eager public what Herschel had seen through that telescope. This was the hoax. No such journal article ever existed. The Sun made it up. But in their coverage, they reported that when Herschel put his eye to the eyepiece, he saw life on the surface of the moon. He was about to become the sole depository of wondrous secrets which had been hid from the eyes of all men that had lived since the birth of time. The 1835 moon hoax was brilliant. Readers were duped. It became the talk of the nation. It was picked up all over the country, reprinted everywhere. Kevin Young found it all fascinating. It has this beautiful uh, uh, pacing, you know, and it starts with sort of, oh, I'm observing the moon, and oh, he reports that the first day he sees the moon, and then he gets better and better, closer and closer. It's almost uh, sort of like the heavens parting. Each day, according to the fake report, Herschel was able to see more and more and more on the moon as he focused his lens. Lakes, oceans, mountains, valleys, plants. And then he spies animals. The first observed was a quadruped with an amazingly long neck, head like a sheep bearing two long spiral horns, white as polished ivory. Almost like a sheep, but not a sheep. Everything on the moon was like that. A lot like things on Earth, but then not quite like things on Earth. Somehow exotic. It resembles the beaver of the Earth in every other respect than in its destitution of a tail and its invariable habit of walking upon only two feet. It carries its young in its arms like a human being. Man on the moon, a beaver man. Then Herschel saw a higher order of human being. We scientifically denominated them as Vespertilio Homo, or Man-Bat. Man-Bat on the moon. Finally, the fake Herschel sees creatures even more amazing, whiter, angelic. Certainly they were like human beings, for their wings had now disappeared, and their attitude in walking was both erect and dignified. Readers ate it up. They talked about it at dinner. They gabbed about it on the way to church. Were there really men on the moon? What was this all about? But I also think there was something lurking beneath all of these hoaxes, and that was slavery. Uh, mm -hmm. And the questions and schisms of slavery, I think, were often made allegorical through hoaxes. Mm -hmm. So how does that work exactly then? Like, what is it? 
that people are seeing that they want to see on the moon that tells us <laughs> what they believe right. about slavery and race. I think of the moon hoax specifically, and the thing that I noticed is there's a hierarchy of being there, and it makes mm. a lot of sense. So, mm -hmm. you know, these people are below, these people, the biped beavers are this kind of person. There, You know, there's a re real um, transplanting of racial hierarchies onto the moon, onto these fictional creatures. And you see that in science fiction still. You know, there's usually sort of a good set of aliens or a good set of people found under the earth and then a bad set. Eventually, the sun came clean and admitted that the whole thing had been a stunt. The newspaper printed a half-hearted apology, weirdly suggesting that the whole stunt had had a useful effect in diverting the public mind from the bitter apple of discord, the abolition of slavery. One of the great things about a hoax is once it's revealed, you can tell what people really believe because they wanted to believe this so badly, mm -hmm. uh, even when it's so clearly fake. I mean, biped beavers on a moon is pretty hard to, uh, in retrospect to see as credible. But I also think there was this real wish to find another place somewhere far away in which you could put your hopes and dreams. So it's like the cat's out of the bag. This hoax was about race. Young isn't surprised by that cat, though, because he found that same cat hidden inside quite a few bags of hoaxes. Many of the hoaxes that I turned up or that I vaguely knew about but learned more about um, were deeply invested in these kind of ideas and deep divisions uh, in our country. And there were ways of sort of working that out, however terribly, um, in the hoax. One of the things that's so striking to me about the 1830s moon hoax is that they're kind of on the side of scientific inquiry somehow, that they're celebrations of empiricism, even though it's completely bogus bunk. Is there some pivot point there where like earlier hoaxes are like, look, science is real. <laughs> and now hoaxes are like, look, science is a bogus. I mean, I think there's a, uh, with the hoax, um, questions of science and questions of religion or questions of truth get worked out. Um, and it, it's almost in times when these things are uneasy that mm -hmm. it might go one way or the other. And I do think you're absolutely right that starting in the 20th century, early part, this, it flips from, you know, I'm going to tell you how things are. And part of the hoax is its authority. And then I think starting in the 20th century, it really erodes. And I think that fear and pain become the topics of the hoax. So, jump ahead to the moonshot in 1969. Okay, plainly, it's a story inseparable from racial injustice and the question of whether we're all in this together or not. We have a poem here. It's called Whitey on the Moon. That's the poet and musician Gil Scott Heron with his indictment of the moon mission, killing it. I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. Ten years from now, I'll be paying still while Whitey's on the moon. You know, the man just up my rent last night, cause Whitey's on the moon. No hot water, no toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. Whitey headed to the moon on July 16th, 1969, the day after civil rights leader Ralph Abernathy led a protest at the Kennedy launch site. I can't say this moment in time isn't about whether all humans are one, here, together on Earth because it is. Leaving the Earth for the Moon brought all sorts of matters into the blinding, flashing light of Apollo 11's launch. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T-minus 25 seconds. That day, three men gained escape velocity and left the Earth behind. Soon, out among the gods, the men in that spaceship looked back at Earth. I used an Apollo 11 that the continent of Africa race facing toward us right now, and of course everything is getting smaller and smaller. Time goes on. It took four days to get there, all the way to the moon. And then everyone back on Earth turned their televisions on to watch. In just 50 minutes from now, well within the hour, the moon is due to have visitors from another planet. On the afternoon of July 20th, CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite narrated the greatest single scientific expedition in the history of humanity, Apollo 11's lunar module, Eagle, 
and two of the mission's three astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, were about to land on the moon. The Eagle has landed. Roger, twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Man on the moon. We copy you down, Eagle. Oh, boy. Thank you. You're looking good here. You hardly ever see Cronkite get excited. The man holds it all in. But here he is like a little boy, so tickled, so thrilled. The astronauts get ready to go outside. It took hours. But you wouldn't want to miss it, would you? 10.39 p.m. Armstrong opens the hatch. He starts climbing down the ladder, rung by rung. 10.56 p.m. He plants his foot on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In the studio, Cronkite gathered himself up for his historic reaction. Man's dream and a nation's pledge have now been fulfilled. The lunar age has begun. The lunar age had begun. But another age began that day. Something else was launched. The lunar age would undermine the very institution and values that Cronkite so iconically stood for. The integrity and credibility of the news. In the lunar age, the more extraordinary scientific research and technology got, the more difficult it became to keep sight of the line between fact and fiction, between the believable and the unbelievable. At FedEx, we're making carbon capture research our priority because Earth is our priority. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2040. We call it Priority Earth. FedEx, where now meets next. Ya llegó el verano. Eso quiere decir que los viajes por carretera con amigos o con familia están a la orden del día. Haz que Denny's forme parte de tus planes de viaje. Así que visita uno de sus restaurantes y prueba el nuevo Red, White and Blue Pancake Breakfast. Es la mejor manera de celebrar el 4 de julio o el verano. Deliciosos pancakes con arañados cocinados a tu gusto. Bañados con fresas, queso crema glaseado, crema batida. Y acompañado con dos huevos, hash browns y tu elección, dos tiras de tocino o dos salchichas. Denny's es el lugar perfecto si viajas para el día de la independencia o en verano. Ya reabrieron nuestros restaurantes y los empleados siguen las medidas de seguridad e higiene. Y con tantos restaurantes en toda la nación, puedes estar seguro que encontrarás la comida que amas allá donde vayas. También puedes ordenar pancakes o cualquiera de tus platos favoritos, como hamburguesas, batidos o sándwiches en Denny's.com. ¡Nos vemos en Denny's! On the first season of The Last Archive, I talked a lot about the era of mystery in the Middle Ages and how it gave rise to the age of the fact and then the age of the number, but also how, with the development of the mainframe computer in the 1940s and 1950s, mystery returned in the form of data. Because data is a kind of knowledge that can only be really reckoned with by computers, not by people on their own. But consider other forces of history in the middle decades of the 20th century. Beginning with Sputnik in 1957, or even really beginning with the dropping of the atom bombs in 1945, science got so powerful that it could do things well beyond what nearly everyone except a handful of scientists could know or experience or understand. The more extraordinary the scientific accomplishments, the harder it became to believe the news. Missiles that could annihilate the population of the entire planet in an instant? Men going to the moon? Eventually, it became kind of commonplace, a little chic, a little George Orwell meets Marshall McLuhan, to wonder whether all the news was fake. In 1968, the BBC broadcast a play called The Newsbenders. We'd like you to help plan the news for 1973. In the play, an acclaimed director goes to meet with a corporate bigwig. The bigwig wants to hire him to fake a bunch of film footage that will air in the future as news. Come again? Plan the news for 1973. 
You didn't really believe there were all these things whizzing about up there, did you? Uh, Sputniks and rockets. <laughs> Astronauts crossing their legs for eight days. How long has this been going on? Since Hiroshima. In the studio, there's a toy-sized model of a lunar lander sitting on a table covered with sand. Remember, this play was produced in 1968, a year before the Apollo 11 moon mission. The filmmaker picks up the model as he listens to an early cut of the news they've created. Fake news for a day five years in the future. Today, April 14th, 1973. First historic pictures by Radstar of the combined U.S.-Russian landing on the moon. Shown here are Majors Webb and Mikhailovich taking their first steps into the unknown. The nine-way hotline finally... Switch it off. This is going to happen in 1973. You're going to make this happen? No. We are going to make models much cheaper. Then we photograph the models. Fake news reels. That's fake news reels. Whoa, dude. The newsbenders was mind-bending. A thought experiment. But it also got to the heart of a real problem. The actual news had gotten very difficult to believe. Atom bombs, rockets to the moon. News in the actual year 1973 was way more dreary than the newsbenders planned for a fake landing on the moon. There weren't even any more Apollo missions to report. Those ended in 1972. Instead, TV viewers flocked to something else on the dial, something different, the Watergate hearings, which revealed that Richard Nixon had lied and lied, and so had a whole lot of his advisors. You couldn't believe anything anymore. But if you didn't want to watch Watergate, you could still speculate about space. Space. An endless tapestry of stars reaching toward infinity. Scattered through its vastness are 100 billion planets on which life theoretically could exist. Yes, that is the sultry voice of Rod Serling. You probably know him from Twilight Zone, a show he started in 1959. The Twilight Zone is where fact turns to fiction, history turns to mystery, and mystery becomes conspiracy. In 1973, Serling hosted a documentary called In Search of Ancient Astronauts. If only 1% of that life is intelligent, there could be 1 million civilizations out there. Listen carefully to that voice. Not even so much what he's saying, but how he's saying it. It's the voice of the news anchor, the authority. It's as if he's hypnotizing you into trusting him. And of that million, it is conceivable that one discover the secrets of space travel. It is possible that ancient astronauts went in search of life beyond their own world and found it on the planet Earth. Why all this new spookiness just after men landed on the moon? Here's what I think. Everyone can see the moon, every last human being on Earth. It's ours, all of ours. It holds out a certain hope for unity. But then the moon holds out a certain mirror of division. Some have got and some have not. White, black, brown, man, bat, beaver men, angels, weighty on the moon. But there's something else too, something that really slays me. I think people like to have things around that are mind-boggling, but then just out of reach. Conquering the moon deprived people of the moon as a mind-boggler. That one huge mystery was solved. There was no white-haired god up there in the sky. There was instead a giant dusty rock. This intense change, I think, got all balled together into a specifically 1970s fetish for unsolved mysteries. Because, well, okay, the moon is a rock, but maybe there were still other mysteries. Bigfoot, Omni Magazine and the newsstand, spoon-bending Yuri Geller on TV. And then there was the weird, snake-eating-its-tail theory that ancient spacemen had visited the Earth thousands and thousands of years ago. And maybe they, and not Adam and Eve, were our ancestors. Or maybe they were the source of our beliefs about God. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. I confess, I love this stuff. 
ancient aliens came to Earth and built the pyramids. Okay, no, I don't believe that. I think it's crazy. But I love the hypnotic fake mysteriousness of it all. The junky science. The completely preposterous historical analysis. If ancient astronauts did land here, what effect would they have had upon early Earthmen? Perhaps they were worshipped, feared, loved. Perhaps they brought gifts, a new world of knowledge. This stuff was all over the place in the spooky, kooky late 1960s and early 1970s. Still, In Search Of was also interested in actual science. Dr. Carl Sagan is one of the directors of the Mariner mission exploring Mars. And he has a special interest in the possibilities of intelligent life in the universe. At the very end, in just the final seconds of this long documentary, Serling introduced a very young Carl Sagan. This is seven years before Sagan became famous for his masterful series on PBS, Cosmos. The question arises, might there have been a visit to the Earth in historical times? It's a kind of mm, scientific justification of theological belief, which people would rather believe uh, uh, in any case. Uh, it's kind of modern dress for old-time religion. I can only say that you can't exclude the possibility, but there's not a smidgen of evidence that is compelling. Sagan nailed it. Believing in ancient astronauts or extraterrestrials, it was like believing in gods. Gods in a godless world. Magic after the great disenchantment. In the U.S., In Search Of became a TV series. But the show's thesis wasn't everything is a hoax. The show's thesis was, everything you thought was a hoax is real. The Loch Ness Monster, ESP, governments and scientists have just been concealing from you all the evidence, hiding it, locking it up in government archives. Nothing was a hoax. It's just that a lot of things were hidden by conspiracies. Rod Serling had died, and so the producers of In Search Of instead hired Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek to host the series. There were episodes about Amelia Earhart and Bigfoot, and of course... UFOs. Sometimes they come in silence, sometimes with quiet thunder. Often they leave marks in the earth, signals of their passing. I watched In Search of as a kid with my mom. I have zero data on whether fans of the show believed in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. I can only report that my mother and I did not, and that was the fun of it. It was like believing, but also not at all believing, in the Tooth Fairy. But now that I've grown up to be a historian, I want to know what was the meaning of this rage for goofy, unsolved mysteries in the 1970s. In one way, I think of In Search of as an update of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Ripley had called his stuff curiosities, But somehow, what started out as curiosities became conspiracies. Because at the same time that my mom and I were watching In Search Of, a lot of other people started arguing and believing that the Apollo 11 mission never happened, that we'd never landed on the moon, and that the whole thing had been covered up by a vast conspiracy. You thought BMW was just the ultimate driving machine. It's so much more. It's also the ultimate electric driving machine, the ultimate room for the whole family machine, and the ultimate design machine. Because the ultimate can't be contained to just one thing. Visit BMWUSA.com slash ultimate driving machine to learn more and see the all-new, all-electric BMW iX and i4. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. You thought BMW was just the ultimate driving machine. It's so much more. It's also the ultimate electric driving machine, the ultimate room for the whole family machine, and the ultimate design machine. Because the ultimate can't be contained to just one thing. Visit BMWUSA.com slash ultimate driving machine to learn more and see the all-new, all-electric BMW iX and i4. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. 
This episode is brought to you by Virginia Tourism Corporation. Escape to the beaches of Virginia for an unforgettable vacation. Reconnect with family and friends while enjoying over 7,000 miles of shoreline, from peaceful tidewater rivers to the Chesapeake Bay to the Atlantic Ocean front. There's a shore waiting just for you. And we've got something for everyone. Kayak the back bay, see the wild ponies of Chincoteague, play in the surf, or simply relax in the sun. Share what you love with a beach getaway to Virginia. Virginia is for lovers. Good afternoon. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. It's September the 19th, 1977. I jotted down Dialogue Conspiracy number 286, but I think it's 287. I keep track each week, but I forgot to write it down. I believe it's number 287. Mae Brussel. She came to be known as the Queen of Conspiracy. At the time of this broadcast, she was 55 years old. She'd once studied at Stanford, mother of five, housewife, After Kennedy was shot, she became convinced that the government was hiding a vast conspiracy. The more she looked into it, the bigger that conspiracy became. These people, the wall of secrecy, the news media being silent, and the patsies locked up, and the psychological profiles, and the writings on the wall, or the diaries, the incriminating evidence, or the source of weapons for all the assassinations or conspiracies will eventually be traced back to the same sources, which is the intelligence community in this country. She launched her radio show in 1971 from KLRB-FM, a community radio station. Then came Watergate, which made a lot of cockamamie theories about secret government conspiracies look suddenly plausible. Her audience grew. She sent out mail-ordered cassettes of her show to people far away. She called her fans Brussels sprouts. Don't become a Brussels sprout. I know it would be so easy if the deep state were running everything. You wouldn't have to think about anything. You could just always blame the deep state. But that's not how history works. I'm going to talk about a book today that uh, I've had a while called We Never Went to the Moon by Bill Casing and Randy Reed. It's called America's $30 Billion Swindle. It's a fascinating book. We Never Went to the Moon is a 78-page self-published piece of nonsense. May Brussel incorporated its central theory that NASA faked all the Apollo missions into all of her other theories. And these other uh, zombies that have been controlled by hypnosis and government drugs. And we'll also go into the possibility that the astronauts were controlled by the government psychological department. Brussel was a researcher. Old school conspiracy theorists are meticulous about research. And she saw her work as giving her listeners a body of previously hidden evidence She'd read newspaper stories out loud, always providing citations. I'm just here sharing the evidence, this sort of person always says. You decide. Believe it or not, you are feeling very sleepy. Herzog, that has been described in the New York Times, September the 11th, 1977. If you want to go to the library and get it, it's a new movie. Radio can work as a loudspeaker and amplifier. Reading something obscure out loud on the radio gives it a new audience. In this broadcast from 1977, Russell mainly read long passages of Bill Casings' moon landing conspiracy theory book out loud. Hardly anyone had read Casings' book or even heard of it. Russell helped to break it out. But she also tried to set it in a much bigger context. Now, the moonshot uh, took place in uh, July of 1969, that great moonshot. And many of you may remember or you may not remember that that was the night that Ted Kennedy had the accident in Chappaquiddick. Now, if you can accept some of the facts in this book that I'm going to be share with you, you have to have a view of history, an overall view of what was happening in July 1969. This was by way of introducing one of her favorite theories, which involved a conspiracy led by the military-industrial complex to get Richard Nixon elected president, which required getting out of the way all of the Kennedy brothers, first Jack, then Bobby, then Teddy, at Chappaquiddick. Somehow, honestly, don't even ask me, this thing is so convoluted. Getting Nixon elected president also entailed faking the moon landing. Why were all transmitters easily faked? Why was there nothing to see other than the launch? Is there any real assurance that the astronauts were aboard the Apollo. 
is there any proof that they really flew a full load of fuel? And he goes into the statistics of the fuel. She went on and on and on. It was all leading ominously somewhere. Then came the Whopper, the simulated moon landing. It's very complicated, but it starts with Stanley Kubrick. He made a film everyone knows, 2001, A Space Odyssey. It was released in 1968. The filming took two and a half years. The original budget was six million, and then they padded it with another four and a half million, a ten and a half million budget. There were 205 special effect shots, and then he said they went into the universities, the industrial, 70 industrial and aerospace corporations, universities, observatories, weather bureaus, laboratories, institutions to ensure that the film would be technically accurate. Brussels conspiracy theory has it that Kubrick made the film 2001 to cover up another film that was being made in Nevada for NASA, which was footage of a landing on the moon that never happened. Faked news, newsbender style. And the Apollo space program could use the 2001 as a cover. He claims that that movie um, in 1968 prepared the American people for the film version of space exploration that would take place in 1969. Now, the year that. I see why people are attracted to conspiracy theories. I get it. Chronology is important. I love lining up a bunch of random news stories on a timeline, tacking them up to a wall with pushpins, and looking for a pattern. That actually is how historians work. At least it's how I work. We collect evidence, organize it chronologically, and look for patterns. For instance, if you've been listening to this episode carefully, and if you've seen Kubrick's 1968 film, 2001, you might have noticed this seemingly uncanny coincidence. 2001 is a story about how ancient astronauts came to Earth millennia ago and left things behind, like a big black monolith. It tells the same story as In Search of Ancient Astronauts. That's not a conspiracy, though. That's just a popular idea. So, I asked the Brussels sprouts, is there evidence that NASA, aided by Stanley Kubrick, faked the moon landing? No, none. But is there evidence that Americans became really vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking in the 1970s? Yes, there's a lot of it. Here are some pieces of evidence I might tack to my wall with pushpins. First, in edition of Time magazine in 1966, with a dark cover that asked, Is God dead? The 1960s were a decade of rising secularism. People were looking for other explanations for why bad things happened. Second thing on my wall, a New York Times front page from 1971, when the paper announced that it was publishing a leaked report, later known as the Pentagon Papers, a report that revealed that the U.S. government had been lying to the public about what was going on in Vietnam. God was dead, and the government was lying to you. Third, I'd pin up news stories about how Americans learned that the FBI had been conducting secret illegal surveillance on civil rights leaders and other activists and infiltrating their organizations. For instance, the FBI had spied on Ralph Abernathy, the civil rights leader who led the protest at Cape Canaveral the day before the launch of Apollo 11. We as a civilized nation have failed. Last thing I'd pin up on my wall, the long-burning coverage of the Watergate break-in and all the lies on the part of the Nixon administration. No wonder Americans in the 1970s had a tendency to submit to conspiratorial thinking. Oh no, wait, I've got one last piece of evidence to pin to my wall. In the 1970s, Hollywood made a gazillion movies about vast government conspiracies, including one about a faked space mission. Capricorn One hit theaters in 1978. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the present time, all systems are go, all lights are green. Capricorn One is like a movie version of Bill Casing's book, We Never Went to the Moon. The film's advertising campaign featured the line, Would you be shocked to find out that the greatest moment of our recent history may not have happened at all? In the movie, NASA fakes a mission to Mars by sending an empty rocket off into space and filming a Mars landing in an abandoned military facility that's been converted into a movie studio. You don't really think you're going to get away with this? Well, I don't know. It's a chance. Maybe it's not a very good one, but it's a chance. That's the Hollywood version of We Never Went to the Moon. The for-profit version of May Brussel, True Believer. 
But then how does this stuff break out and into the real world, to the 21st century and modern conspiracy theories, the 9-11 truthers, the birthers, the QAnoners? You really need only to stop and pause at the strange and unsettling Kubrickian year of 2001. The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This is from a Fox special from 2001 called Conspiracy Theory. Did we land on the moon? I think of it as a missing link that gets us from stuff like May Russell and a radio show to the mainstreaming of conspiracy theories. Unlike in Search of's episode about ancient astronauts, it offered no substantial equivalent to a Carl Sagan. Instead, a NASA spokesman appears on screen every now and again, attempting to make clear that these claims are just baseless nonsense. But Fox quickly pivots back to sell the conspiracy theory for ratings. There are those who claim that believing in man's one small step requires one giant leap of faith. Bill Casing was an analyst and engineer at Rocketdyne. No, he wasn't an analyst and an engineer. Casing was a technical writer. In the footage of the ascent stage going up, what you don't see is an exhaust plume coming out of the rocket engine nozzle. What a ride, what a ride. So in February of 2001, Fox was broadcasting newsbendery stuff like that, suggesting huge events of the past were maybe not real. That September, a terrifying event took place in the present. Terrorists flew airplanes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York. And this time, someone was ready, right away, to call it a hoax, even while it was happening. Even as firefighters and police and rescue workers were trying to find survivors in the flames and the rubble, Alex Jones, the May Brussel of the 21st century, was on the air saying the whole thing was fake. Well, I've been warning you about it for at least five years. All terrorism that we've looked at from the World Trade Center of Oklahoma City to Waco has been government actions. They need this as a pretext to bring you and your family martial law. We've come a long way from the hypnotists of the 1950s. But listen to the way this guy is trying to hypnotize you to relieve you of the obligation of thinking anything through, of analyzing the evidence, by offering instead a species of historical explanation, that the world is even more terrible than it appears, and that only Alex Jones can make sense of it. I'll tell you the bottom line. 98% chance this was a government-orchestrated control bombing. I've been telling you this was going to happen just two weeks ago. I put the call... The moon landing, the old New York sun, in search of... The Twilight Zone, Capricorn One, May Brussel. Do all these bits and pieces I've got here in the last archive line up together to form a conspiracy? A conspiracy to turn Americans into conspiracy theorists? No, because it wasn't a conspiracy. It was just the force of history and of politics, the expression, the exertion of power. Conspiracy theorists and historians do have a lot in common, but somewhere we diverge. Historians believe history is driven by ideas, by economic forces, by technological change, and even by biological and environmental factors. Historical evidence for this kind of change over time, it's everywhere. Conspiracy theorists believe that the course of history is driven by terrifying higher powers that control everything and then conceal the traces of that control by hiding the historical evidence. The conspiracy theorist always believes in an unseen reality. The historian always believes in reality, hiding in plain sight, in the actual evidence of the historical record. This is Apollo Control at 148 hours, 7 minutes. In about 24 seconds from now, the spacecraft will pass the imaginary line into the Earth's sphere of influence. Stand by for a mark leaving the lunar sphere of influence. Men flew to the moon in 1969, and then they fell to Earth. Or did they? Next time on The Last Archive, how Americans never really left that lunar sphere of influence.
The Lost Archive is written and hosted by me, Jill Lepore. It's produced by Sophie Crane McKibben and Ben Nadef Haffrey. Our editor is Julia Barton, and our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Martine Gonzalez is our engineer. Fact checking by Amy Gaines. Original music by Matthias Bossi and John Evans of Stellwagen Symphonette. Our research assistants are Olivia Oldham and Oliver Riskin Cuts. Our foolproof players are Yoshi Amao, Raymond Blankenhorn, Matthias Bossi, Dan Epstein, Ethan Hershenfeld, Becca A. Lewis, Andrew Perella, Robert Ricotta, and Nick Saxton. The Last Archive is a production of Pushkin Industries. At Pushkin, thanks to Jacob Weisberg, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carly Migliori, Christina Sullivan, Eric Sandler, Emily Rostek, Maggie Taylor, Maya Koenig, and Daniela Lacan. Many of our sound effects are from Harry Jeanette Jr. and the Star Jeanette Foundation. Special thanks to Simon Leake. If you like the show, please remember to rate, share, and review. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Jill Lepore.